Thank you for inviting me. Um, with coffee and donuts this morning, how about a good war story? Emphasis on good, okay? This one has to do with a bunch of Marines, all ranking Marines, all members of the 75 millimeter recoilless rifle platoon in Korea during the Korean War. Only thing was, one of them had four legs, and her name was Reckless. She was acquired to haul the heavy shells for the recoilless rifles. In the jargon of the day, the Reckless Rifles. <coughs> Fired by, the guys called themselves the Reckless Rifle Boys. So it's easy to see where she got her name. What she did for these guys, and in time so brilliantly, had everything to do with how the Korean War changed. And the Korean War changed dramatically. About one year into the war, and unfortunately it would turn out to be only a third of the way through, everything about it changed, where it was fought, how it was fought, distribution of the troops, rules of engagement, all of that changed. And that's what, in time, paved the way for her story. So if you will indulge me a little bit of time for some history, I think to understand the lead up to the war and the early going is going to give you a better context to understand her story and why she became so important to these guys, indeed why she was so cherished. However, a bit of a side note first. Reckless was always called a horse. She was a horse. She was a war horse. Guy said she could be quite the mare when she wanted to be. I have like some horse people here. You would know what that's all about. Anyone would, really. The fact of the matter is she was a very small pony. She was 11 hands, 1 inch. That's small for a pony. Ponies go up to 14, too. Um, a hand is an equine measurement. In the old days, it's four inches. In the old days, they literally went up the side of a horse like this. So 11 hands, one inch, 11 times four, 44 plus one, 45 inches to the withers. The withers is the inside elbow, where the neck and the back meet. There's a, a hump of bone there. That's the withers. I'm five foot three. I put the top of her back about here. I could just lean myself over her, right? So now I'm going to amend what I said. Not so much small as, as low down, okay? She had a butt on her would have made a quarter horse proud. <laughs> she had a good, strong, broad back, well-muscled <coughs> shoulders, good, strong <coughs> neck. But indeed, she was low down. So I tell you all of this, okay? Remember, she was small. I talked to more than 60 guys that knew her in Korea, they like to say, served with her. And thereafter, I never heard anyone say pony. Not one. A couple of them said to me in really hushed tones, they said, she was very small. She was very small. But she was their horse. She was their war horse. Mostly they just yelled, hey, reckless. So I honor that. And, and you Marines, poor pony, a little bit wussy, right? You know? Doesn't quite work. Okay, so for some history, Korean War started at the end of June 1950. It was the Civil War. North Korea invaded South Korea. Simple as that. Several points of invasion along the divide between the Koreas, 155 miles from the Sea of Japan in the east to the Yellow Sea in the west. Strongest invasion north of Seoul, which then, as now, the capital, so that was sort of appropriate. And in the early going, advantage North Korea. They just pushed down the peninsula, found very little resistance. South Korean troops, just no match. Stood their ground and got pummeled, deserted. Some of them joined North Korea. And it wasn't until a, a short five weeks into the war, early August 1950, in the area of Pusan, and that's a major port down in the south and getting pretty close to the Korea Strait. I mean, that's far down. By that time, we had brought in enough troops from Japan and Okinawa our good friends, the Brits, had come in with some troops. And in that area, by virtue of, by virtue of reading the city with, um, it was called the Pusan Perimeter, kind of a firewall, we were able to stop the forward momentum. We did not turn this war around, no way, but we just sort of put the brakes on for a bit, built in a pause, if you will, and that was that. Reason North Korea so much to the advantage actually goes back to the closing days of World War II. We knew, we knew Japan was going to be defeated. We knew before we knew where and when, but we knew it was coming. 
And what the Allies realized as they, as they were aware of that is that the country of Korea, in those days, still one country, the whole peninsula was Korea, Korea was going to regain its independence, become independent again. It had been occupied by Japan for 35 years. It had been a spoil of war of the Japanese-Russian War of 1910, and in the ensuing 35 years, Japan had done a number on Korea. I mean, they had destroyed their political system, their educational system, downplayed their culture. I mean, they just done everything to really kind of grind, grind Korea into the ground. So what we realized is that this country, <clears throat> this country was going to become independent, but without any political structure to guide it. There was no president, there was no national <coughs> assembly, no constitution. Essentially, I mean, think about it, essentially a landmass, a rudderless landmass. I mean, populated for sure, a lot of foment going on. I mean, you had, you had Sigmund Rhee, and there was a name that stayed around for a while, Sigmund Rhee and his nationalists, and they were, you know, jockeying for top position. You had Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of the young man that runs North Korea these days. He and his communist sym sympathizers were, you know, trying to get the top position. So all of that's going on, but no, no, no structure, no guidance, shall we say. So as the war ended, we did too. For one thing, Japan, at that point defeated. Korea independent, we did two things. First of all, we divided Korea. It was the United States that did, did that into South and North Korea. We set them up as a protectorate which is to say the United States guided South Korea as they got on their feet, and Russia did the same for North Korea. Supposedly a five-year arrangement, but by 1948, three years into it, South Korea felt themselves good to go. They had elected Sigmund Rhee as their president, they had a national assembly, they had a constitution. I'm sure with a lot of grand language, basically they said, you know, thank you, and off you go. And as we exited South Korea, Truman asked the, the United Nations, at that point a fledgling, three-year-old United Nations, just imagine, if going forward there were any problems with South Korea, would they address them? They said yes. And that's what set up when war broke out that it be a United Nations undertaking, when war broke out two years later. Um, we left some army in country, less than a brigade, sort of help make peacekeepers, whatever. Uh, we left what materiel was in country. We did nothing more than that. In the north, it was quite different. Russia stayed on. They didn't leave. Russia trained North Korean troops. Russia moved in materiel, and that's what set up North Korea to be so much to the advantage and, and invade South Korea two years later. However, important to remember this was going to be a short war. I'm sure a lot of you do remember. I mean, this was going to be a matter of months. We were going to go in. We were going to push North Korea back over the line and get out. Initially, Truman hoped he wouldn't even need boots on the ground. He thought maybe naval blockade and air support would do it. That didn't, didn't work. But, I mean, again, you know, quick in and out, word on the street, boys were going to be home at Christmas time. He asked General Douglas MacArthur to command United Nations forces. MacArthur at the time was Supreme Allied Commander in the Far East in charge of the occupation of Japan. Of course, the, the, the general said yes. You know, he's on the same page, too. I mean, this is going to be fast. He designed something called the Inchon Invasion. Inchon is the port for Seoul. It's about 30 miles to the west. <clears throat> and what he did is he brought our Marines in through the port, hooked them up with our army coming across the Kimpo Peninsula, which is the landmass that hooks Inchon and Seoul. They re-entered Seoul. It was a tough battle, but they retook the capital, returned it to South Korea in a formal ceremony, in the process, broke the backs of the North Korean supply lines, sent their troops into disarray. We were looking good. I mean, moving right along, you know? In the, uh, there was a little problem in the North, said the general. It was vague. But our troops were going to go in and take care of it. Just a few weeks and they'd be back out. No need for winter clothing. They weren't going to be there that long. General is quoted as saying the Chinos will be just fine. In the United Nations, in the Security Council, Communist China said, don't do it. If you invade our neighbor, we will come in in their defense. And we ignored them. And they said it more than once, and we ignored them more than once, and we sent our Marines around to Wansung. 
Long Sun is a port on the east coast of North Korea. <clears throat> Marines landed there, headed north by west toward something called the Chosin Reservoir, body of water about the size of Lake Tahoe, soon to be called Frozen Chosin. Our army went up through the center of the country. They were heading north by east. Their intel told them they were going to get cut off, and they pulled out, and most of them got out of time. There were some for, for, forward observers got caught, and then the Marines went in and got them. But basically, the Army got out. The Marines, not so lucky. They didn't get cut off. They got surrounded. They walked into the worst battle, one of the worst battles of their history. It goes down in their lore with the low woods from World War I, Pelie and Iwo Jima from World War II, and now Chosen. Their casualties were terrible. And if it was any small consolation, they were worse for the enemy. And the enemy now, yep, good to their word, behind North Korea was communist China. In numbers, we had no anticipation of, no, no concept of, hordes of troops poised to hurl themselves at us. And it would be that way throughout the war. Their battles opened savagely. They sometimes fell apart for lack of organization, but the onslaughts were brutal. And some tough information came out of all of this. For one thing, this war was not going to end anytime soon. And for another, no one was going home at Christmas time that year. And indeed, the war did, did continue apace for about another six months. North Korea pushed back into South Korea, and we pushed them back over the line. But by the summer, of 1951, and that was about a year from when all of this started, the peace talks opened. North Korea was pretty much shoved to the bargaining table. They dragged their feet over the next couple of years as these talks lurched on, called off for every little infraction, so they were a lot off and a little on and a lot off and a little on, but once they opened, once they opened, the rules of engagement changed and the war became a holding action. We, the Allies, holding the land that belonged to South Korea, for the South Korea, according to UN rules, um, not going for any more, trying our best not to give up anything. In the, in, the, in the North, they fought by their own rules, and they scrapped for every little bit of South Korea they could get a hold of, and for all their efforts, almost nothing. At that point, it's pretty much, it's pretty much felt that, albeit behind closed doors, the powers that be, the proxy powers, shall we say, the United Nations and the other UN members who had signed on on behalf of South Korea and on behalf of the enemy uh, behind North Korea, Communist China, and the more silent partner, Russia, all of them, all of us, already knew this was nobody's good idea. This war had already cost too much, and the returns weren't there. It was going to cost a whole lot more. The returns were never going to be there, and we'd better figure out how to get out of it. And so, with the, as I say, with the rules of engagement changed and the war becoming a holding action, what happened is the troops moved to set up along the divide between the Koreas, the Allies right up against the very top of South Korea, a no man's land in between, the enemy facing us, and now the topography of the country became a real issue for everybody. Korea is very, very mountainous. More so, the more north you go, there is a major range, the Taebaek Mountains, that runs north-south along the east, Foothills are plentiful, spill all the way to the Yellow Sea. A lot of them very big. Guys would say to me over and over, you would drag your way up one of these hills, you'd finally get to the top, you'd look out, and damn, there's another hill staring you straight in the face, and it's bigger than the one you just got up. So that's the situation, and now most of the fighting was from the elevations, from the tops of these foothills, from ridge lines that topographically were cut out a little bit down from the summit. And it meant most everything went uphill. The guys, their weapons, the rest of their, their supplies, all of that had to, had to go uphill. Army Corps of Engineers did a great job of carving out mountain roads for sure, but most times there was a place they couldn't get any farther, and, and often that was the, the entrance to the, to the valleys within these foothills, where the rice paddies had been, Korea's premier crop, uh, destroyed blackened, you know, they're more in spirit than anything else, and they looked hard as a rock, and I'm told they stunk to high heaven, which is an aside, but the fact of the matter is they weren't solid, and the trucks just bottomed out, so there really was a point at which it was manpower, real manpower to get everything uphill. 
At the same time, because of the topography, because we were now shooting, you know, hilltop to hilltop and across wide spaces, a weapon found its calling, and that was the 75 millimeter recoilless rifle. Um, had debuted in World War II, had been used a little bit, but now it really, really found its place. And that was because it was deadly accurate at long range. And in test firings, this was up to four miles. Big bruiser of a weapon, 115 pounds, almost seven foot long, sat on the, on the ridge line um, as a rifle direct sight. That meant your gunners were to either side of the, of the barrel. Nobody's down in a trench anywhere. Um, but in real time, what it meant, I mean, four, four miles in test firings, but in real time, say, say we were taking fire you know, from a mile, a mile and a half, two miles across no man's land. You know, we're we're catching it from an enemy not somewhere in a in a, a you know in a in a pillbox in a low slung building. We can't get our air. We can't air, get air support over there. We can't get our machine gunners near enough or our our mortarmen. And you know, we're catching it. We're catching it. Well, you'd you'd call up the reckless rifle boys. I mean, if they weren't already up on the ridge somewhere, up they'd come, and they'd like as not they take they take out the problem. So they were prized. But for these guys, the caveat were the shells. The recoilless rifle, the reckless rifle, took shells that weighed 20 and a half to 23 and a half pounds, 30 inches long. You know, about like this. So you were dealing with heavy, cumbersome, awkward, and the guys had to shoulder these. You know, everyone was to take one on either shoulder. Apparently, there were a couple of big, big guys in the company. They literally laid a third this way across the other two. But for the most part, 40 plus to almost 50 pounds, but that was extra because you had your own backpack of 60 pounds of food and water for the day, change of at least socks, first aid supplies, um, survival gear, flashlights, small arms, small arms, ammunition, all of that is here. And now you've got this extra weight here, and you're dragging your way up these hills, and these were not your Appalachian trails. I mean, this was scrub. This was real, you know, lousy footing and pulling your way up any way you could. And you'd get up there, and you'd unload your cells, and I hope to God you left your backpack up, up there, you know, the first time up. But you went back for two more shells, and two more shells, and two more shells, as long as those guns, guns were in play. As long as you needed them in play, they needed ammunition. No ammunition, no gun. If it was a pickup firefight, maybe not so long. If it was a planned operation, well, you knew how much ammunition was going to be used. If it was setting up to be an open-ended battle or something that was just blowing up and you really didn't know, those guys were hauling shells all day and into the next. No way around it. So that's the situation that presented itself to the members of the recoilless rifle platoons. There were three of them attached to the Marine regiments in Korea, three Marine infantry regiments, one each had one of these platoons. This story has to do with the fifth, as I said initially. Um, and in the spring of 1952, the fifth regiment's platoon got, a, got lucky. They got themselves a new commander. His name was Lieutenant Eric Pedersen, Pete Pedersen, he liked to be called, and he was a horseman. And I subscribe to you that horse people think horse. You don't tell your non-horsey friends because they think you're nuts, but it's just kind of lodged <laughs> tears a little bit in the gray matter, you know. You're, you're jammed up in traffic, you know, stock still, nothing is moving, and eventually you just start to say, if I had my horse, I would just trot my way out of here. Or more practically, you've got that pile of weeds over there, and it's laughed at everything you've ever thrown at it. Well, you put your horse over there. He'll take care of it, you know. So I do think this, is, this was Pedersen's frame of mind. He had been raised around Jackson Hole. He had been a rancher between the wars, you know, so this was, this was what he was about. He was also said to be a real, a real enlisted man's commander. He started out as an, as an enlisted man before World War II. He'd moved over to the officer ranks. He was thus a, a Mustang. I think he watched those guys breaking their backs until he just couldn't take it anymore, until he just, just had had it. Um, and he decided a horse, maybe a horse could help. Horses were not official equipment in the Korean War. But his superiors, knowing his background, I think basically said, Pete, you want a horse? Fine, just go get a horse. And could we just not talk about this anymore? Just do it. 
I now make it October 2nd, 1952. The platoon was in reserve with the rest of the anti-tank company and one of the battalions. Reserve company, you all, your reserve, reserve camp, you all know, takes you back off the firing line. You're not the, you're not the operative, operative unit of the moment. You're back five, six, seven miles. Um, plenty busy, but the little hairs on the back of your neck get to settle down a little bit because you're not, you're not taking incoming. Okay, you, you know, everything else is going on. This morning, Pedersen got himself a jeep, told a couple of his guys to go with him, um, come with him, and they attached to the back a utility trailer. Um, these came right out of World War II. Four foot by six foot metal boxes, I'm sure you've seen pictures, welded sides, sat on two hubbed wheels. You know, there were no horse trailers in Korea. And, and I also had a guy say that his sergeant said to him one time, you never get all you want anyway, so you have to improvise. So this was improvising. That's what, with that, they turned and they headed down to Seoul. Pedersen knew the city. He didn't go roaming around wondering, you know, oh, where am I going to find a horse? He knew if he was going to find one, what it would be. And it would be one of these little ponies, the Jeju pony. It was Korea's indigenous breed. It was the most prevalent. Um, it had been the back, backbone of, of, of the country for hundreds of years, transportation, agriculture, a good source of protein, um, also their racing stock. So he knew that that's what he would likely find, and he knew if he was going to find it, where that would be. He went to where the old Seoul racetrack had been. This had been destroyed in the first go-around when North Korea first invaded within a couple of days. They had turned it into a supply depot, and later on, when people went out, they found out the horses were all gone, the shed row had been destroyed, uh, safe had been looted. Seoul had been through four changes of hands. It was wrecked. But it was now back in Allied hands and had been for a while. The 8th Army went in and took over the spot. They kept the name. They called it Racetrack Field now said to be the busiest air hub in the Far East. One runway, incoming, outgoing, all day long. I mean, that had to have been some commotion, right? Everybody jumping off for the front went through racetrack field. Your USO players, there were about 5,000 of them through the war. Marilyn Monroe, you've seen all the pictures, right? Her laying down on the, on the floor of the helicopter, Bob Hope, all the biggies, but a whole lot more than that. Um, statesmen, couriers, the press. Eisenhower. Eisenhower, one of his, his um, 1952 campaign slogans was, I will go to Korea and end the war. And, and they sent him. It was a secret mission until he landed. And then he, you know, he, they landed him out at, out at the big airfield, Kimpo, out on the peninsula, brought him into Seoul. And then he, too, was, was using racetrack field. Around the periphery, still some horse people. We think from the early time when all this was going to be over fast, remember? Um, well, the racing authority thought so too, and they had sent down to the south for another band of horses. They owned their horses, which is just another way of running a racetrack. And then everything fell apart, and we think those were some of the horses that just, you know, that's where they wound up, and some of the handlers. And it's where Patterson found this little, little pony, this little filly, Chestnut, or if you like Western terms, sorrel. At 11-1, they got her into this metal box, but they had to ride her caddy corner. That's how small the box was. They said she had a halter on. They hooked a rope from the, from the, the, the throat latch to the front, and that was the extent of the tie down, and she balanced. And they turned this rig around, and they headed back for reserve camp. The Marine that remembers this procession rolling through the gate in the late afternoon said it turned the air blue with a whole lot of, what the blankety blank is this blankety blank horse doing here? And this guy said to me, we said a whole lot more than that. I just, I just can't say it to you. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll imagine. And it was the start of this amazing story. Pedersen stayed in the loop, but he was the commander. He had more to do than just take care of the horse. He turned Reckless's care over to his gunny sergeant, gunnery sergeant, right-hand man to the commander, runs the, sh runs the show day to day. I think the combination of these two men was brilliant because Pedersen, a rancher, 
um, particular part of the sport, a little bit of money, interested in confirmation and breeding. He had 250 Yankee greenbacks in his pocket to buy her, didn't have to requisition military funds. Joe Latham, so much the opposite. Poor Southern horseman. A uh, poor Southern, I mean, he grew up working on an aunt and uncle's farm in the South. And I think Latham knew, as well as anybody, how to make a horse do day to day something they had no natural inclination to do, and to do it willingly. And he said to me, I had, I had the luck to, to talk to him years later before he passed, and he said, if you're good to them, they will do anything you want. He knew he had to do two things. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he knew he had to condition her. Condition, habituation, same thing. It is to convince a horse, and it can be done. You can convince a horse that that terrible sight or that terrible sound, if the horse approaches it, the way you teach it to will not kill it. I mean, that's basically what conditioning is all about. To do this in a war zone, <clears throat> when, where you know you couldn't go up on the ridge and say, "Could we stop the war for a minute, please, while we train the horse?" You know, I mean, you know, you gunners over there, could you just be quiet and you mortarmen? I mean, obviously, obviously not possible. I think to achieve what they did to train her, condition her in that situation, really spoke to the steel she was made of. The other thing he knew he had to do is he got, had to get all of these marines to bond together into one tight unit. One of them had four legs. That was it. That was the only difference. He needed them, you know, just to glue, just to glue together. And, and <clears throat> early on, he was always, <clears throat> always telling these guys, go up, go up to her paddock and, and make sure she's okay and, and does she need any water and maybe she wants a treat or, you know, did she have enough breakfast and this and that and the other thing. And apparently it took no, no encouragement at all. I mean, there was always somebody, always somebody up there. These guys made her one of them. And if you ask them today, they, they, they almost, it is so quiet what they say. They say to me, she was, she was a Marine. She was one of us, Semper Fi. That's all they say. They don't overplay it at all. For her part, for her part, she embraced all things Marine. She loved their sea rations. I like to say she shared them generously with the guys. Ate all of their mess hall chow, except, except I had a cook tell me she didn't like syrup on her pancakes. Um, drank a lot of beer, gobble beer. Brewed in Detroit. The slogan was brewed in Detroit for good taste. The guys said not quite. It was pretty bad. She thought it was pretty good, and she drank plenty of that. She drank some whiskey, uh, an occasional mixed drink. Ate their cigarettes. Liked it if you would open the pack, and if you weren't quick about that, she ate them anyway. Slept in their tents when she wanted to. Remember, she was slow down, especially in reserve camp, <clears throat> where the camps were fenced in and she had the run of the camp. You know, if on a given night she wanted, she would just glide in. They said she was a hog. She would plop down right in front of the kerosene stove. Everybody just moved over. Nobody cared. Reckless is here. Just moved a little this way and that. And she ran in their bunkers, you know, when they were on the front line and they took incoming, and you all know that's over firing the lines. The yelling camp is incoming, incoming, and you run. If she was in her paddock, she had her own bunker, you know, regulation bunker, properly positioned away from the firing line. If she was out of, out of the, the, the paddock with one of the guys, like as not, she would just run in, into a bunker with them. So these were regulation eight-man bunkers. So it was eight men and a horse. They gave her rank. She was private first class. That came very quickly. Um, serial number was H1. I don't think there was ever an H2. They say by the new year, by the beginning of 53, she was an integral member of the platoon. It was no longer a question of, you know, should we take reckless? When these guys went out, if they went out on patrol looking for trouble, if they were called up on the ridge, they went, she went. She was also clearly on the fast track for a promotion. She made corporal in four months. <laughs> what they needed done goes back to what I said initially. They needed a way to get these heavy shells uphill. And that was still at the crux of it. Before she became reckless, before this great story grew up around her, that's what they needed, and that's what they still needed. 
And when fighting broke out, you know, wherever it, wherever it broke out on, you know, on the main line or on one of the hilltops, they would position ammunition as close as they could get to that point if they thought this was going to be something, you know, not of any great consequence. They might just be pulling up a truck and working out at the back of a truck. Sometimes they actually started to stockpile ammo, an ammo jump, an ammo depot. And she and a handler would come to that point. They would strap shells on her back. She wore a pack saddle, and then they had a series of straps, kind of a pannier thing where, you know, they, they attached the, the shells. Published photos show four, all, all published photos. There were times, I think, Latham bumped the number as needed, but he was also a, a conservative and smart horseman, and you keep that weight down, and she was going to last. Um, they would give her a treat and a smack on her butt, and she and her handler would go back, usually out across one of these open areas, you know, cutting across on, on one of the berms that cut across the rice paddies, and then scale the, the hill to the front lines, and they would unload her, give her another treat, another snack on the butt. She was a gourmand. It was all about food. And they would go back and forth, hour upon hour as needed. I mean, this was tough going. She was used hard. They cut her no quarter, just like the rest of them. Um, gave her water, gave her treats, gave her rest when they could, and sometimes they just couldn't, and she and that handler kept going. What they got her to do and what made the story so amazing is she was able to do this alone. They got her to the point, and remember, visually, this stuff changed. I mean, wherever the fighting broke out, and in relation to that, wherever the ammo was positioned, I mean, that was always different. They would show her the route a couple of times, and then she would go by herself, going back and forth and back and forth. Again, giving given breaks, all of that, but just dogged. I mean, she it spoke to you know whatever whatever adjective you want to you want to give her courageous, dogged, indomitable. I mean, she was all of that. And they said even when when shrapnel was falling, you know, when they were taking incoming, she would not turn around. She would not back up. She would try to get to a hill if she could and flatten herself against a hill. But she was just was always forward. And one guy said to me, "Thank goodness they got her to go alone. She was that fast." No one could keep up with her. What she did and what, how this situation worked is she made these guys her herd. And that's really at the basis. I mean, a horse is a herd animal. They run in the herd of nature. Other, others do the same. Um, these guys became senior members of the herd for her. Some of them were up on the front line. Some of them were at the ammo dump or in camp where she was surrounded. And it was that force field, that energy field that that held this whole thing together. Certainly love, certainly attachment, but, you know, the force of the herd, much of which is a, a, a hierarchy of age, and she was young, and these guys were all senior members. Um, and I will, I will be fanciful and say, even, you know, on a given day, when in horsey terms she said, stupid idea this was, you know, I'm going back to Seoul. I mean, even then, it was the power of the herd that held, made this whole thing work. By the spring of 1953, events in the world were starting to telegraph, we've got to get out of here. We've got to wrap this thing up. We've come as far as we can go. Um, Eisenhower, for one thing, had come back and said that he found it unacceptable for our men, our troops, to be standing on the front line of another country, holding that country's land without resolution. Joe Stalin had died. And I think now the Kremlin was far more concerned with who was going to lead them next than the problems of a little country thousands of miles away. And even interestingly, communist China. Communist China <coughs> entered the war as an emerging nation, certainly when we were watching, and they came out of it a world power, but at great cost to them as well. And in recent years, documents have come to light, uh, com communist Chinese documents, one of them, there is an exchange between Mao Zedong, their leader at the time, and the top commander in Korea, in which Mao was asking for a reading on the situation. And his commander says to him, I can hold the country as long as you want, but I cannot win this war. So you can see that everybody now was on the same page, that time to get out, except, except North Korea, who was going to fight to the midnight hour. I mean, they didn't want out. And they involved the 5th Regiment now in the worst battle for them of the war, and that was the Siege of the Nevada Cities. Battle of the Nevada Cities, if you will. There were three, three hills, Reno, Carson, and Vegas. Excellent observation posts, excellent combat posts. We had them, the enemy wanted them. 
and they hit they blasted the entire marine sector that first night and that was so typical of them just got all the hills involved but those were the three they wanted reno went down um, we had to let it go we firebombed it if they if we couldn't have it they weren't going to get it either carson held outpost venues went down that for us was the most important and we needed it back and we put three days and nights of fighting into getting outpost venues back and reckless reckless showed what she was made of as nothing anyone could have anticipated beyond all just beyond all reckoning i think she went virtually 24 7. she hauled for the recoilless rifles in the day at night she was out hauling for the mortarmen which is not something that was known, but I had a mortar chief call me, and he said it was my crew she was supplying. And had she not, we would have run out of ammunition. Um, for her participation, for her contribution to that battle, she was awarded two Purple Hearts. A Purple Heart is given for each combat injury, as you know, and she sustained two of those. She also wore every medal accepted every commendation, every citation that the other members of the recoilless rifle platoon were given, and she wore the fourragere, and that's the tightly braided rope ring that the 5th and 6th regiments wear on their left shoulder, and that is, that is at the behest of the French Ministry of War from World War I. The armistice <clears throat> finally was signed the end of July, 1953. It was an armistice marked on July 28th. It was an armistice. It was a, peace, a, a ceasefire. There were no articles of surrender. There is no treaty. We are still, it is still an open conflict. But the fighting stopped, and with some problems in the DMZ over the years, it has remained, remained thus. Um, interestingly, it was actually signed on July 27th at 10 in the morning. All the guns silent at 10 that night. And it's the first time in the war that our troops could come out of their trenches, take off their helmets in safety, light up a cigarette in the night without cupping their hands over that front end because as you take the drag, the, the, the front you know, flares red and the enemy can, can see where you are. And then as I say, it was marked on the 28th. Um, those guys, none of them thought it would hold, I will tell you. I guess the officers were confident, but the men, will, men, men said that they were sure that the fight, that the guns would, would ring out, would start again, you know, the firing would start again that day or the next day. But in time, indeed, indeed it held, and then started to rotate out in greater and greater numbers. Reckless, Reckless was there a while. She was there in the spring of 1954, still there, when she became Sergeant Reckless, finally got her promotion to Sergeant. Promoted by the top Marine in all Korea, the head of the whole 1st Division, General Randolph McCall Pate. I think he was quite smitten with her, actually. He said that he had seen her, he had seen her with his men on several occasions, and he knew, knew full, full well not just what she did with them, but I think more importantly for them. And I think it was his great pleasure to, to promote her. It was a formal ceremony. They built a platform. They got the colors from Regimen. He, he, um, he pinned on the chevrons. And then he threw a party for the company. And then, and then by and by, yes, it was time to think about getting her out of there. Something the guys were adamant about. The officers, I think the officers were agreeing they would do their best. But those guys, she was coming out. Not home. Home was Korea, but she was coming out. They did, however, write a very nice letter to National, to the to Marine Corps headquarters in Washington, requesting permission, requesting funds. Got a very nice letter back saying no. Sorry. <laughs> no money. Too bad. Wily bunch they are, though. I think they had their bases covered from the beginning. They had written, the Marines had written the Marine Air Wing law, and they had said, in the event that you were ever asked to transport a horse, this being the first time, what would you say? And they wrote back and they said, well, you know, in the event that, we would consider it a challenge. So eventually challenge was met. Um, she, had begin, she, had, she had started to pick up a little bit of, of a fan base um, in the States. One of the commanders had left Korea and sold a couple articles to Saturday Evening Post, and she'd been written up in Stars and Stripes. And an executive for a freighter line heard about her, and he said, if you can get her to Yokohama, Japan, 
we'll bring her in Deadhead San Francisco free of charge. Two hour flight. How hard is that? She disappears is what happens. Um, I think that General Randolph McCall Pate, who is now the Assistant Commandant in Washington, said, or one of his, you know, his right hand people said, just get her out of there and oh gosh, we don't know what happened, you know, just get her out of there. Nobody's looking. Somebody looked up, one of the guys looked up, and she was gone from camp, and he asked a buddy, and the buddy said, oh, they just took her down to, to Kimpo, which, you know, was the big airfield. Put her on a flying box car, plane set the bottom panel levers down, you know. Two hours later, she, she's on the pier in Yokohama. Where, surprise, the SS Pacific Transport has been in dock for 24 hours. This was a story that was a secret in Korea, but not in Japan. The ship had been in port. The Marines had gone on board. They had built her a cabin behind the wheelhouse, starboard side. They'd moved in all of her supplies, her bedding and her food and so forth. So, you know, obviously they knew what was going on. And there she arrives on the pier. They put her in a loading crate, winched her up, set her down on deck and into her quarters. This was a working freighter, by the way. It was full of large white albacore tuna, reckless in the fish. Turned that ship around, headed up the coast to Otaru, packed in a little bit more fish. And then they headed for San Francisco, northern route to San Francisco. Um, one of these stories that uh, also kind of grew whiskers through the years, it was reported that the ship hit a typhoon and she was almost washed overboard, except the refrigeration engineer on that very voyage called me, and he kept a log of every crossing, and he's on the phone reading to me that the weather was absolutely perfect, calm seas, no weather anywhere north of Indonesia, she was a wonderful passenger. Uh, the, captain, the captain turned her care over to an able-bodied seaman who in civilian life was a rancher who said she was the best horse he had ever handled. And for her part, ship to cook to captain, as you pass your stall, please stop and say hello. And if you're smart, keep your smokes in your pocket. <laughs> ship put into the Embarcadero the night of November 9th, too late to present papers, and that meant that Reckless came off the ship onto American soil the morning of November 10th, 1954. November 10th is the Marine Corps' official birthday. How cool is that? <laughs> Met a pier full of press, reporters and photographers, went on to the Marine Memorial Club for another press event. That night she was the guest of honor at their birthday bash. As the youngest Marine there, she accepted the first piece of cake to a round of applause turned around and started eating the flowers off the dais. <laughs> Got another round of applause. <laughs> Little darling could do no wrong. Next day, they took her to the Bohemian Club. And if you know San Francisco, this is a male membership club. I would describe it as a resolutely all-male bastion. To this day, she is said to be the only four-legged female who ever bellied up to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Um, went down to, to Camp Pendleton, was signed in. You will look at the photograph and think for all the world that she's signing herself in. She's so intent on that pen. Spent a couple of months at, um, by then, Captain Pedersen's little ranch outside of base. That was the extent of Department of Agriculture quarantine, which is to say not, wasn't going to happen. But she, you know, she was there for a couple of months. Then she was back at Camp Pendleton on active duty, Sergeant Reckless. For the next five years, different different assignment, no longer the war footing, of course, um, represented the regiment at all official functions, promotions, retirements, the like. She was always on the parade ground with the crowd. Um, every summer there was a major rodeo for Navy relief, and she led the parade, letting, leading in the likes of Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, you know, stars like that. And I think what the guys liked the most is she went on there on their long training marches, their force marches, you know, the multi-day marches. And they said that whenever the column was about to march down Main Street of whatever town was on the route, they brought her to the front. She would be right behind the colors, leading the column down Main Street. And there was one march, took the whole regiment, 5,000 men, the whole regiment to San Diego. That was a 50-mile march. And there she was in downtown San Diego, right behind the colors leading all those guys through through the streets of San Diego. They said she had an aura about her. I mean, just a presence that said, I am reckless. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is where I belong. 
Um, one more promotion. In 1959, Reckless got her rocker, as the Marines say. She became Staff Sergeant Reckless, grade E6. <laughs> Pretty good going. And she was promoted by the Commandant. Even though I had a Marine say to me rather testily, I think, the Commandant does not promote anybody. Leastwise, he doesn't promote a horse. And I said, well, yeah. Well, the Commandant was General Randolph McCall Pate, now the Commandant. And I will tell you in photographs that he looks very, very proud to be with um, surely one of his favorite horses. And then the next year she was retired. The formal warrant said in lieu of, in lieu of pay, full mess and board. She had a, a, a ceremony for her this time. She was, she was watching the others on the parade grounds, troops marching for her review. And then at the end, she and her handler walked around the parade ground one last time. They said she was generally a very quiet horse. But this day, at the exit, she stopped. And she threw back her head and let out one giant whinny. The, Marines that, or the Marine that told me this, he said he thought she was being very, very traditional. Because short timers will take a pack of playing cards. And each day they throw out a card. And on that final day, as they're driving off the base, they hand the ace of spades to the MP. And he said, in effect, she was handing off her ace of spades. In retirement, they say she was belly deep in alfalfa. So I would imagine her care was top notch. She had two more falls for a total of four. And over the years, she had thousands of visitors, including many guys that knew her in Korea and now came back with their families. And one guy said to me, you know, he said, to my five-year-old, it really didn't mean anything. She was a very pretty little horse, and that was the extent of that. And he wasn't so sure that his wife got much of the import either, you know. But he said it was very important for him to introduce them to the horse who had kept that ammunition moving forward and who had taken the wounded and the dead off the hills and out of harm's way. Today, there are two statues to her honor. One is at the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Triangle, Virginia, that's just outside of Marine Corps Base Quantico. And last fall, another one was it unveiled at Camp Pendleton. Marines will tell you that because of what Reckless did, a lot of guys came out of Korea alive who would not have otherwise. And in closing, I'll tell you what else they like to say. They like to say she's the only horse who came out of that war with fame and a name. <laughs> they called her Reckless, and that's her story. So, Janet, where were you, how long ago, when you first heard of Reckless? Real truth? Nothing Real? but the truth? Yeah. <laughs> I heard about her in 1992. It took me a long time, didn't it? I'm a slow writer. Um, I was at the racetrack. I was doing some freelance writing. I, I, I had a freelance business. I was doing some writing for Thoroughbred Record, and I was hanging around Belmont and Aqueduct. And I don't remember which track I was at the day that I'd gotten to know this Marine, who was now a mutual clerk, and he came up to me in the press box one day. And he said, I have a story for you. And he started to tell me this. And I got goosebumps, and I still remember. And I knew it wasn't just a horse story, that I had to find those guys. But that's, that, was the, the, that was the start of it. Are you a native Connecticut girl? No, I'm from the Bronx. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that works for me. Which is to say a New Yorker, but I say the Bronx. I have to say, the many how many times I've heard you, I enjoy it more and more each time. Oh, I learn a little my. bit more each time. And I have to tell people, if you have, you've got to read this book, because she told so much, but there's so much more so in much. here that is just fantastic. Oh, my. It's fantastic. Will you I just come with me to every talk now? <laughs> yeah. Be my sidekick? Thank you very much. Now, I mean this with love and respect. Was, yeah. was this your first book? No, second. 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 I wrote a book called On the Fence, a Parent's Handbook of Horseback Riding to help parents survive the sport. And what I tell them is I can't save your shirt, but maybe we'll save the farm. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, my. When, when did Reckless pass? 68. 68. 1968. She was 19. Wow. 19. Wow. Yeah. So did your research take you all over the country? 
Unfortunately not. Okay. I didn't have the budget. By yeah. phone it did. Okay. Well, by phone. Okay, I should say That's yes. Great. I shouldn't have I shouldn't have even tipped my hand, right? Um, but yeah, I just, you know, found them and they're and the dies were wonderful. Each one would suggest another and then various all the different ways you just keep, you know. Now when Reckless was finally written, mm -hmm. was it hard to get it sold? For a publisher to well, I that. published. I did, I'm an independent publisher. Okay. Um, and the reason is, I was looking for a publisher, and you know that takes time. And I heard that I had two competitors coming behind me, and I thought, ah. So I jumped. The, I jumped, and I published it myself, and beat the market by eight months. So I'm not competitive. Two right? competitors on records. <laughs> yeah. There wow. Are two other, there are two other books out. Wow. Yeah. I I've never heard of. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I would say that mine is the most, I mean, and I don't mean this to, to be bratty or anything, mine is the most complete, and I, re I, I, I there's an old story, there was, a, there was a book written right after the Korean War by Andrew Gere, and it, you know, it was, it picked up some, 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 you know, readership back in the 50s, and all the stories have spun that, and I went back and just researched again, and there, there are things that I think were not true there. I made my own corrections. Where is home for you now? Chester. Oh. Well, she met Art. <laughs> <laughs> she knows her. She knows her. Yeah, Art Wicknick. Who? Art Wicknick. Oh, yeah, Art yeah, yeah, yeah. Nonsense? In, yes, yes. He's in, um, he's in Haddam. Higginham. 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 Yes. Well, he's actually the one that got me to the American Legion. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, can we give her another round of applause? Yeah. There are books here. If anyone is interested, there's seven dollars. Gotta get that book. I'll tell you. <laughs> just a few I'm quick. Sign you up. Thank just you. a few yeah. quick announcements, uh, and then we'll close. Um, real quick, would you do me a favor? Your guest this morning. Your first name? Kathy. Kathy and Debbie invited you. On go. Uh, oh, great. Is anybody here invited by Debbie? Okay. So, anyway, I'm glad that you're here. And guess what? Oh, I'm sorry. Because you're here, we meet once a month on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. There's always free coffee and donuts. If you ever want to join us, you're more than welcome to join. We start with the pledge. We try to listen to a guest speaker. We always close in a prayer. Hope you won't mind that. Number two, could you please give a round of applause to Bob Boucher? Um, I don't know how well you all know Bob, but I don't think there's a day I don't hear from Bob, either in an email or something. He's working, in my opinion, tirelessly behind the scenes to make sure all of you have a great uh, Tuesday co Veterans Coffee House. So I'm, I just love the guy. I just love what he does. And I wish you all knew him like I've come to know him. And Janet, it is an honor to have you here. It really yes, is. Thank you very much. And I'm um, to be here. And you're a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to donate this to the uh, Wallingford Senior Center. So they have a library in the front of the building. If uh, you're anything like me, I just, I don't know why. I just <laughs> love military aircraft. So um, I always think, uh, you remember, what is it? Um, big things come in little packages. I was, I was never a proponent of that. The bigger the box, the bigger, the better. I saw this book. Uh, I, I got it a few years ago at Costco just because it was so big. Just a little pocket book. Yeah, yeah so I, I got to have it. But um, uh, there's some phenomenal pictures in here. To piggyback on what George was saying earlier about aid in attendance, um, we're going to be having an attorney come in here in October. And one of the things he specializes is helping veterans get benefits that they deserve because a lot of benefits say, well, I, a lot of veterans will say, I can't qualify for that. I can't. Well, this guy's going to help you qualify. And I'm asking George, I think I've mentioned this to you once before. I want George to be here kind of as our, our guard dog or um, on guard duty. So if he smells any BS from this <laughs> attorney, he's going to tell us. Okay. But I met this guy, he came to my office, did a presentation and it's the first attorney I've met in a long time that I thought, he, I, I, he's got the kind of bedside manner that's important to me, okay? Um, I was telling somebody the other day, uh, oh, no, I was just telling you this morning, we
we were talking about uh, jewelry stores in St. Thomas. And I said, well, we've got this famous uh, favorite jewelry store in St. Thomas. I've only been there twice. Uh, the guy could be just filling me a pile of it. He could be ripping me off, but I just love the guy. He's just so nice. He always gives me a, a rum drink. Um, <laughs> so everything about the guy, I love him. So if he's ripping me off, well, he deserves it because he's so nice. And, and that's how I feel about this attorney. I, I don't want him to rip anybody off, but I like him so much. I think we can all really benefit from it, okay? So um, anybody have any questions about anything? Our guest speaker set, uh, next month, real quick. Yeah, that will be John <clears throat> John White of Cheshire, and uh, he was a naval officer uh, in Vietnam, and uh, he's uh, he's written books, various subjects, and so forth. And he's also a literary agent uh, in his career, dealing with uh, other authors and so forth. He's had published over three hundred books. So he should be an uh, it should be an interesting uh, subject that uh, he'll be talking about in August 29th here. So this guy John said that never happened, and they tried to squash him for saying that. And a very famous admiral, what was the admiral's name? James Stockdale. Came to his defense. You're not going to want to miss. You're going to want to tell your friends. It's wicked cool, and he's such a sweetheart of a guy. Okay. Anything else? Anybody? George? Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Love it when you come. Okay. I'd, I'd like to mention very, very just one good. thing. See, there is one more thing. Yes, Bob. Okay. Uh, Tom, yeah, am I pronouncing your last name? Oliveira? Yes, sir. Okay. Tom is, is not a veteran, but he has veterans in his heart, and he's going to be video uh, taping any presentations that we're going to ask him for. And I think uh, it's very gracious on his part to, to offer to help us and, and videotape and uh, have a, a library of speakers that uh, will help other coffee houses or Legion Post or whatever. Uh, on September 19th, we're, we will be starting up the uh, Veterans Coffee House in Cheshire, Connecticut. So, of course, you know, if you wish to go to the first meeting, by all means, let us know. And that's about it. I think we're all set. Well, so Thanks Tom's, again, Tom's sitting here in bare feet, and any guy who can sit here in bare feet is my kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> With regards to the Cheshire Coffee House, they contacted us, asked us if we would be willing to do the same thing there. And uh, we're going to tell you when the date is because we would like you all to try to come out that morning just to support um, Cheshire's veterans. And I'll tell you why. It, it's their senior center is not as vivacious as this one is. So if they see all of you come out, I think that ought to help them. And, and Bob and I already met this one guy who's an unbelievable uh, character. He was in Vietnam. He was a gunner. And he has got some unbelievable stories. We're trying to talk him into talking to us. Did I say that correctly? Don't listen, Janet. Um, <laughs> I feel like Janet could be an English teacher I had years ago, <laughs> criticizing me on every little thing that I say. But um, I just love this guy, because he just tells it like it is without thinking. So he's really shy, but we're going to try to get him to speak for us. I think you would just adore him. Uh, would you just close your eyes for me and bow your head in prayer for me? Father God, you have continued to bless us with amazing friendships and amazing gifts uh, Janet's story about Reckless is just phenomenal. And just I think about the millions of people that don't know the story, just like they don't know the story of Thomas Hudner and, and Jesse Brown. Uh, we're just so grateful to Bob for his tenacity, always trying to do what's great for this group. And we just ask, Father, that you will just um, to bless these people here today, be with them, look after them, keep them safe and healthy and happy, and we just look forward to more of these types of events coming in the future. Father God, we just thank you so much. In your son's most precious name, amen. amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Janet. Thank you.